this presence of worship and adoration. Church, let's turn to scriptures at Romans chapter 12. We'll read the first eight verses. This morning we had a message from chapters 14 and 15. We'll stay in the Romans. The Holy Spirit inspired the apostle of the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. He wrote to them and also to us 20 centuries later. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace, grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Father God, we are before you this evening, Lord, and our hearts are already full, full with your presence. It is such an atmosphere of the presence of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, and we ask you to continue to, to sanctify us through and through, our minds, our soul, our spirits. Father, I'm so thankful and grateful, Lord, that this evening we continue to stay in your presence. And I ask you, Lord, that you would continue to teach us. Bless this word, Father God, to be the living bread that will feed us, Lord, tonight, but also will continue to feed us throughout the rest of the week and for the rest of our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would give us pierced ears to hear and to understand what the Holy Spirit has to tell us, each and every one of us. I pray, Father God, that you would also anoint the Word and me as a, your messenger, Father God, as a vessel. In humility, I ask for your fresh anointing, Lord. Help us, Father God, that we obey what you have to, to tell us. All of these, Father, in Jesus' beautiful name, we ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people say, Amen. please be seated. Thank you so much, young people, for uh, leading us in a beautiful, wonderful worship. As I'm, I was sitting here and taking in all the, the worship and the presence of the Spirit, I said, well... My heart is full. I could be ready to go home. But uh, I believe that uh, the Lord still has something to talk to us, to teach us. And this evening, according to the scripture, that the spirit that impressed it on my spirit to bring a message that I would say it's a continuation of this morning's message. For those of you who were present with us, um, we've talked about the importance that we as a community, we are united in Christ. And to understand that that is not only the command of Jesus, that we would love one another, but also he prayed for all of his followers that they shall be one. And that's a precondition of the manifestation of God's presence in our midst, of the power of the coming times, the future times of the kingdom of God to be manifested in our midst, 
It's so important that the people of God are united. And we've looked that Paul came against the spirit of division, the spirit of judgment, and the spirit of despising one another in chapters 14 and 15 in Romans. And tonight, the message that I have for Bethany Church is that now that we are called to work every day for the unity of the church, now we should look for the spiritual gifts that the Lord wants to continue to bestow upon the church so he can do his work of building and edifying the local church. For those of you who do not know me or have not been here this morning, I'm Pastor Romeo Pale. I'm semi-retired, moved from Bethesda, uh, Troy, Michigan, a couple months ago in Nashville, actually in Franklin, Tennessee. And I'm uh, grateful for the invitation of uh, your pastors uh, to be with you last yesterday with the Sunday school teachers and today all day in the morning and in the evening. But I, I'm so grateful that uh, I had this weekend to spend just to taste the spirit of your church. It is so good to be together. The message that the Lord has laid upon my soul to share with you is, I title it, Finding and Using Our Spiritual Gifts gives our lives purpose, meaning, and satisfaction. Let me say that in Romanian. Folosirea darilor noastre spirituale oferă vieților noastre scop, sens și satisfacție. Actually, Jesus himself teaches us uh, the great secret of a life that has purpose and meaning and satisfaction. And actually, in Mark Chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus declared, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Later in Mark 10, in verses 43 to 45, he declared, whoever wants to become great among you. And this was in a moment where he announced that they are heading towards Jerusalem. And they will... The disciples will witness how their master, their rabbi, will be handcuffed, will be judged, and then will be crucified. But also, he said, on the third day, I will rise again. But they missed the second part. And then they just heard that their master, their rabbi, will be handcuffed, will be arrested, will be destroyed in their minds. So who's going to be now the greatest? Uh, who is going to be a f the first among? And Jesus gives them a, a, a lesson. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to become great among you must be, whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. And he gave himself as an example. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the Lord Jesus lived a very short life on this earth. His 33 plus or 33 and a half years that he lived on this earth was very short. But he, he lived a life of meaning. He actually came to save the world. And in his very short life, he... he actually fulfilled the will of God, the will of the Father that sent him. And he lived the most fulfilling life. He saved the human race. So the thesis or uh, the main thought of, the, of, of my message tonight is the key to a life that has purpose and meaning and, and is abundant for you and I is to give ourselves away in selfless service to others. Let me say that in Romanian. Che a trăiri unei vieți cu scop, sens și satisfacție este de a te dărui pe tine însuți într-un mod altruistic, altora. And this is something that comes against, it goes against our human nature because in, especially in our generation, it's about me, myself, and I. It's all about me. What about me? What am I getting out of this? This is the, the philosophy, the mentality 
And it's, it's difficult, uh, and I actually want to appreciate our uh, young politician-to-be, that he actually left behind probably a career of business, as a businessman just to go and serve others. And this is something that show and displays humility and displays that there is a crucified heart and crucified life. And actually, this is the divine math. Because it is, when Jesus came, he, put, he turned upside down, just as the disciples were accused that they turned this world upside down. Jesus was the one who actually came with a total different uh, mentality. The kingdom's mathematics says the first is the last, and the last is greatest. The one who gives is the one who actually receives. Serving God is what gives our life significance and power to touch and transform other lives. I would like to read again. I'm going to ask you to project on the screen the first two verses, verses 1 and 2 from chapter 12. Because I believe that these two Bible verses actually cr create a foundation for the Christian living. In the first 12, 11 chapters, Apostle Paul describes in a theological way, in a theoretical way, in a doctrinal way, what God has done for us in Christ. And now in chapter 12, the last chapters, he goes into the practical stuff. What does it mean? What that means for us? How can we, you know, appropriate all those blessings? And these two verses, let me read them again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and, and perfect. And what is here, Apostle Paul in a metaphorical way, he talks about the caring of the cross of Jesus in a, on a daily basis. And this is his metaphor. Because if you remember when, when Jesus told all of them, whoever wants to follow me, let him what? Deny himself, pick up his cross, how? On a daily basis, daily, and then follow me. And Apostle Paul makes it clear that without the daily uh, taking the cross, daily mortification of the sins as the Puritans were, we're talking about daily crucifixion of our own self, our old man. Without carrying the cross daily, nothing that's going to be taught in the next chapters will be able to be fulfilled in our lives. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but Paul makes it so clear. We need to go to the cross first. We need to start at the cross First, we need to put on a cross our old self, our Adamic, something that we actually were born with this natural inclination towards sin, toward rebellion. The Bible calls it of the flesh. In Limba Romana, it's Ephira Pamantiaska. In the Greek, it's Sarx. It's not the flesh as in the, the physical aspect of flesh. It is that natural inclination, is that stronghold that the devil has gained in the Adamic race, in, the, in all of the, uh, those children of Adam and Eve, generation and generation after generation, all the human race, we have this natural inclination towards rebellion, towards sin. Nobody taught us. It's something that the devil has gained that stronghold in our lives. I mean, I am a father and a grandfather, you know, and uh, I did like 25 years of children's ministry. I was a Sunday school director. I'm telling you this. 
You deal, you look at a one and, one, and, one and a half year or two years old child, boy or girl, and you tell that beautiful child, please don't go to the wall plug and stick your fingers in there. And you know, you turn around and what does she or he do? Just go and stick his fingers, her fingers. Who taught that child to be rebellious and disobedient? Nobody. Is the way we were born, and how many, you know, I, I have here a few people that used to be uh, my students in, in Sunday school and the youth. How many times you heard me, Flav and Liz, telling you guys when you were growing up, you guys were born sinners. Okay, we know, Brother Romy, yes, we all were born sinners. That's why Jesus had to come and die for us. And that's why Apostle Paul says we need the cross. It was absolutely necessary for Jesus to come and die on a cross to die, to die for our sins, but also Romans 6 says that he not only took our sins, he took our bodies on the cross. And when, we, when he died, by faith, we died with him. And, when, and that's what we, I see it's, uh, it's behind this uh, farm doors, Baptistry, right? When you have a baptism, right? When you are lowering and, you know, emerging that candid under the water, that's a symbol of that person spiritually dying with Christ. It is covered, it is buried symbolically under the water as a symbol, but also is a powerful a faith symbol that we by faith have died. The old Romeo, the old you, Mary, John, uh, Benny, we died with Christ. And now by being, we don't let the candidates under the water, right, pastors? We bring them up because that symbolizes our resurrection with Christ as a new being. Amen? We are a new being in Christ. And that's a powerful symbol of what Paul says, all, there, all the old stuff is gone and we are a new, renewed person. And Paul says, without saddling this at the cross, you're not going to be able to do all the serving, all the, the, the ministries that Paul is teaching us in chapter 12. But he also uses something, and we're going to spend another minute here. He's talking about a living sacrifice. And this is very unusual, although powerful metaphor. Because when you talk about sacrifice in the Old Testament, you know the, the priests were there at the temple, or the tabernacle before the temple, and they were held by the Levites. So the Jewish man, or the Jewish person was dragging that lamb or an animal that was supposed to be blemish, without blemish. And it was dragged at the, at the altar of God right there in the temple, right? And the priest was there and said, why did you come before the Lord? Well, my conscience is burdened by, and he was Declaring and confessing his sins. He said, lay your hands on the unblemished animal, on the lamb. And it was by faith. The same principle of faith operated in the Old Testament. So while the Jewish man, the Hebrew, was confessing his sins, the sins were transferred onto that animal that was unblemished. Do you have any other sins that you have to confess? No, that's it for today. So those sins were transferred unto the animal. The animal was sacrificed. The heart of the animal was pierced. The blood was collected. The blood was sprinkled onto the altar. And that's how that man, the Jewish man, went home discharging the sins by faith by another life that was sacrificed instead of his. So we see John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. It was Jesus of Nazareth that he was the Lamb of God, the Son of God, 
the perfect, the unblemished, the only perfect human being, and God put all of our sins unto his life. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that he made sin. Him who knew no sin. It was about Jesus, was perfect, unblemished. And he died instead of you, instead of me. Glory to God. Well, that's when we think about a sacrifice that Paul uses here, a living sacrifice. What do you mean a living? The problem with our human nature is that it's not enough to be crucified one day and be done with it. If we're not going to the cross daily as Jesus calls us, if we are not doing what Paul says here to bring ourselves as a living sacrifice unto the Lord, we have the ability, if we are today on a cross, to jump off the cross from those nails and to be continuing to sin. That's why we need to bring ourselves as a living sacrifice every day, every decision, every crossroad. Lord, I'm here. Help me to follow you, to obey you. Empower me to do your will. We need to live in a total dependence on the Spirit of God that lives and resides in us. Without God, without His Spirit, without depending on the, on the Spirit of God, we are just going to continue and continually sinning. Hidden sins, it was re reminded to us by brother, young bro brother David, we need to continually bring ourselves as living sacrifice. Not like a sacrifice that sneak out of the altar, off the altar, but to stay on the altar, crucified. And may God help us. Continues Paul in verses 4 and 5. I'm going to move a little faster. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. And he continues. We are the body of Christ, and I, I know there are some theologians in this room. Of all the metaphors... That we are the bride of Christ. We are the flock and he's the shepherd. Uh, I believe that this is probably one of the most functional analogy when Paul says, don't you know that we are the body of Christ? Because as I mentioned this morning, God has placed us in this body for the very purpose of growing together, to be edified together, to have a purpose together. I'm, I said it this morning, I will say it again this tonight. Our salvation is personal. It's based on my personal faith and accepting the gift of life from Jesus Christ. But our sanctification and our purpose is as a body of Christ. We need together to grow. How can I display God's love on a horizontal if I don't have a brother or a sister to display my love towards? How can I display my forgiveness if I don't have a brother, God bless him, that will step on my toes? It's going to get me angry a little bit. Then I have a reason to forgive him. You know what I'm saying? In the body of Christ, we have this relationship on a horizontal, but also in the body of Christ, we are called to serve one another. I know that in business, we have this uh, 2080 formula. And oftentimes in churches too. In other words, they say the highest productivity, 80% of all productivity is done by about 20% of very high intense employees. It shouldn't be in the 
body of Christ like this. That 80% of the work to be done by 20% of the people. We are the body of Christ and we should not have parasites in the body of Christ. We should all be engaged in the work of the Lord. Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, they both declare that nobody was left without a gift. All of us have at least one gift. Some have more. Jesus says, a master or a king had uh, two different parables that uh, went away. And he entrusted his servants, one five talents, one two talents, and one one talent, right? And he is going to come back and he will request all of them to give a report what they've done with the things, the talents that were, they were entrusted. Church, hear me out. Don't believe Satan telling you that you don't have any gift. It's a lie. Everyone in this room has at least one spiritual gift. All of us, and all of us are important. There's no such thing that, you know, the, the preachers, the teachers, they are important, and somebody that, lives, that stays, you know, on a, a second from the last row, it's not important. False. We all have a function in the body of Christ. I could say, well, my finger, my pinky doesn't have a function. It's false, because then that pinky, if I don't use it, you know, the blood will stop flowing into that. It's going to stop functioning. It's got, it's gonna, I have no use for it. In reality, every, every member of the body has a unique work to do and a different role to fulfill. And he continues in 6 to 8, having gifts that before according to the grace given to us, let us use them a prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, and so on. Each and every one, I'm going to ask you to project on a screen 1 Peter 4, 9 through 11, where the same reality Apostle Peter this time declares, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Verse 10. In my translation, an ESV says, as each one, as every man, as every person has received the gift. I want you to, the whole church to repeat with me, as every man, as each of you. This is something that we need to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. There's no parasites in the body of Christ. Each and every one. We need to find out. We need to determine. We need to investigate, to, to find out. And this is something that every one of us, we need to identify that gift. And as I said to the Sunday school teachers yesterday, just because I found out that this is, let's say, teaching, and teaching happens to be one of my, my, my uh, gifts, spiritual gifts, uh, <laughs> About 35 years ago, uh, I was a different type of teacher than now, after 35 years of experience. If you just discover your calling, could be teaching, could be a prophet, could be uh, an evangelist, could be whatever, maybe, maybe uh, in helping. Because we sometimes think that only those who preach and teach and sing, no, 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 it's leadership skills. There's, there are gifts of encouragement. Do you know that the church needs encouragers? Actually, we need this quite a bit because we have the opposites. Unfortunately, have too, we have too many in our church. Oh, predico What kind of preaching was that? Or what kind of... And we're just so good, as I said in the morning, you know, judging, despising. This is not coming from the Spirit of God. It's coming from a different spirit. We need some encouragers. We need people that will build up. We'll, we need people that will invest. We need mentors to invest themselves in the, in the younger generation, to raise them, to invest in them. There's so many 
such a high variety. There are speaking gifts, such as teaching and preaching. There are power gifts, faith, healing. There are gifts of inspiration, prophecy, vision, interpretation of tongues, relationship gifts, counseling. Yeah, we need some counselors. Encouragement. Young folks, go get, a, get an MA in psychology and counseling. Be useful to the body of Christ. Absorb, immerse yourself into the Bible and the scripture and then integrate with that, those psychological concepts. There, we need leadership and mercy, gifts of mercy. We also have gifts of giving, gifts of administration. These are spiritual gifts. Oh, fratele administrator. Oh, that's a spiritual gift. The Bible says, not Pastor Romeo. It's the Bible saying this. Gifts related to creativity, arts, music, and so on. Well, I'm looking at this building. I, I know there were a lot of creativity, people that God invested with spiritual gifts. They look like, like you know, oh, he's a builder. Oh, remember when God sent two people to Moses, said, I'm sending these two people. I put in them wisdom, creativity. Those are spiritual gifts. Let's not constrain the spiritual gifting just to preaching, teaching, and singing. False. Everybody has something to do in the kingdom of God. That's my calling. That's the calling of the Spirit of God this, this evening to the church here, Bethany Church. Rise up. God has a calling for every one of you. Not just a handful. I was so glad to see this stage full with young people serving. But it's so important to find the gift that God has placed in you. Stay before the Lord. Pray, even fast. Because I don't want you to... Get in heaven. Because, again, this is not about salvation. Salvation is the free gift. Receive Jesus and you are saved. I'm talking about reward. It's something else. It's the reward that you, have, you will get when you get in heaven. Imagine, and sometimes I'm imagining myself when I get to heaven and Jesus says, Welcome, Romeo, on my heaven. And then he takes me over my shoulder and said, but let me show you, if you would have obeyed me and my spirit, and if you would have gone into the direction of the gifts that I placed in you, but you did not obey me. And those gifts were gone forever, never been used. My brother, my sister, each and every one of you has received from the Spirit of God at least one gift. Find it. It's going to take time to develop it. If you are a teacher, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a teacher of the Scripture, invest yourself, your time. You know what's my definition of passion? Show me where you spend your time your money, your resources, and I'll show you what you're passionate about. Hello? If God has called you to be a Sunday school teacher, now I'm going to pick on you guys because uh, you pay my guests to be here with you yesterday, and I came here and serve you. Invest in that calling. Invest in some great books. Maybe take some classes of speech, communication, writing, something that, that will develop that gifting in you. Paul reminds Timothy, say, a gift was placed in you by the laying hands of the group of elders. Rekindle that gift. It's something that we need to do. We need a lifelong, and I'm so Grateful for you guys, young folks in the church, for appreciating your pastors. God bless you. But every, 
every calling that's in the church, if you're a pastor, if you're a musician, if you're a teacher, continue to invest. I was telling Sunday school teachers yesterday, the moment you stop reading and stop learning, you better stop teaching. As a pastor, we need to come before you well prepared, immersed in prayer, immersed in the spirit, immersed in the scripture to bring the living word of God to you. You know when your pastors are unprepared. You know when the preacher is mumbling and humbling here and he's not prepared. You know that. That's why we need everything we do to do it for the Lord and to do it with excellence. To do it with excellence, with passion, with everything that we have, with every fiber. My time is up, but I want to remind the church to connect the two messages this morning and tonight. The Holy Spirit wants to bring revival. The revival will not happen until the unity of the church is patched up. If you know you have a problem with your brother, with your sister, there's some cracks in the relational unity of the church. Go and repair them. Go and ask for forgiveness and try to patch it up because that's not only the prayer that Jesus raised, but also his command. Only in the unity of the body of Christ, the spiritual gifts will come to life and the presence of the Spirit and the manifestation of the powers of the age to come will be manifested in the church. When we pray for healing, healing will come because the body is one, because we are one, because we love one another, because we appreciate one another. How many times I said this morning, there's in the scriptures written, one another? 60 times the Holy Spirit put in a New Testament 60 times. Pray for one another, love one another, carry each other's burden. Because in this one another ring, the presence of the Spirit comes alive. We love one another, we care for one another, we pray for one another. Miracles happen, healing happens, the prodigals are coming home. And the spiritual gifts, the Spirit of the Lord has given to each and every one of us, will come to life, will be manifested, will not be 20, 80, not even 80, 20, will be 100% an army, an army of the Almighty God. Bethany, be the church that God has called you to be. God bless you. Amen.